around 2007, uh, I was involved in creating a school in Africa, in uh, Kinshasa, which is the capital of Democratic Republic of Congo. And when I started that school, there was no electricity in school. And soon I realized that truly there is a direct relationship between standard of living around the world and electricity. In the other words, if you don't have electricity, you don't have clean water, you don't have education, and you don't have many other things. The global energy demand is up. It's going to be 50% by 2050. And the need to drastically reduce carbon emission also is there in a humongous way. I am all for renewables, solars, wind, hydro, and all of that. But today, only about 8% of the energy need on our planet is being done by renewables. The only solution that we have that we can stem the tide of what's going on with the climate change truly is nuclear. And when I mean nuclear, I mean today the nuclear fission and hopefully in the future will be a fusion. So at this point, what I wanted to do is do a mental exercise with us and the panel. Imagine if we could design an ideal nuclear reactor. Just imagine that. What would that look like? We probably want to design a nuclear react reactor that is 100% safe. We want to design a nuclear reactor that has zero carbon emission. We want to design a nuclear reactor that's always on. We probably want to design a nuclear reactor where maybe we can cut the cost of uh, electricity by maybe 50% compared to traditional nuclear reactors. It has a low project risk, power plants that can never melt down. Maybe we can do something where the instead of uh, 10 years in developing nuclear reactor, we can do it to three, four years. It has greatest geographic flexibility rather than the traditional nuclear reactors where it needs to be next to body of water. And then maybe we can even focus on a modernized lysing case. We can also make it proliferation resistant. Maybe we can make it such a way the modules are road shippable, right? So that you can carry it on the back of a truck or you can carry it on the back of a train. Also, maybe we can design this reactor so it doesn't require water for cooling, okay? And also maybe it requires one-tenth of the components than uh, of, uh, one tenth of the components uh, of the traditional nuclear reactors. Okay, you see all that? Imagine all of that. If you could do that, wouldn't you say that we've done something incredible? Advanced modular reactors are 100% safe. You can see all the characteristics. By the way, we've also designed it such a way that you can take an engine of a coal plant out and you put one of these in, and then you can use the existing infrastructure and still would, would work. So let me tell you a little bit about what it looks like. The whole system, the secret in the whole system is in the fuel itself. So we have these triso particles that has a uranium kernel at the center with two layers of graphite, and you put basically 19,000 of that inside this larger ball, graphite ball, which is the size of like a tennis ball, and you put about 225,000 of that inside a pressure vessel, and you create a nuclear reaction, and instead of water, we use helium for cooling. So that's why it's called a high-temperature gas-cooled reactor. And as you can see, only one-tenth of the components of tra traditional nuclear reactors are necessary, and the reason is because the safety is not in the pressure vessel itself, it's in the fuel. So it's truly revolutionary and disruptive in every possible way. Like I also indicated, the way we're doing this is not like traditional nuclear reactors where they're one-offs. We're going to create these factories around the world, I call them integrated product facilities, where the modules are built like Legos, and we ship them basically to the site. This way, we can scale them all around the world. And instead of traditional number of years, we can, instead, instead of 10 years, we can really deploy that in three to four years. It's really interesting when you look at the uh, energy uh, consumption around the world. 25% of the world energy is for industrial application. 
That's, that's huge, 25%. And one of the good things about uh, SMRs and AMRs are that uh, the temperature is such a way, or it can be such a way, where it can be used for hydrogen production, it can be used for water desalinization, it can be used uh, for cement factories, petrochemical organizations, and really make a huge crack on that 25% problem. I think that's one of the major discriminators are of uh, AMRs uh, as a distinguished to SMRs. And just, just for everybody's understanding, when I say SMR, um, uh, I mean really light water reactors or generation three, whereas the advanced modular reactors or high temperature uh, gas cool reactors as well as maybe sodium cool reactors. So there's a distinction. And those reactors, the AMRs, uh, are the ones that are capable of temperatures uh, where uh, they can really make, make a major crack uh, in that market. And I think that's, that's huge, really huge. I mean, not only because of the climate change application, but if you only also look at it from business application, imagine that we'll have a world where the cars can run on hydrogen and we can solve uh, the uh, problem in uh, not only hydrogen, we, we also have water issues where we can use the high temperature to uh, use, uh, you know, for water desalinization and many other things. And I have a very strong feeling that other organizations will follow as we're trying to get to net zero. I just want to make one point uh, with respect to all the other panelists. Again, just like I said before, when we think about the market and whether the market is going to open or not open, all that, all that is very true, very important, very dynamic. We have our survival at stake. <laughs> you know, we have an emergency situation. So these things to me are more necessities. They are mass things that have to be done. And I hope that the consciousness of humanity raises to that level that we recognize that before it's too late. <laughs>